Testing. Okay. Hi, hello? everybody. Hello, hello. Am I on? You on? You on? I'm on. I think so. Okay. You want to go start? Sure. All right. Hello. Um, I'm Scott Moser, and this is uh, Josh Mr. Harlow. Josh Harlow. He used to say Josh the Bomb Harlow in but the name, but he decided to, <laughs> to tone it down a bit. Yeah, I didn't want to uh, piss off my mom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is an evil user, super user's how-to of launching instances to do your bidding. Um, um, so I guess... Yeah, so, so just for certain people that don't know what Cloudon is, it's a, it's a, we'll, we'll go into a little more depth, but it's available on all the operating systems that you've uh, used. Uh, there's various things that, Windows is in progress, but it's, it's something you've always used for most of your time that you used instances in OpenStack or EC2 or elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so we'll go quick, kind of give an idea of, like, uh, of how instance initialization works. So after you go, you know, you launch your instance, I don't know if, if any of you know or care necessarily how the underpinnings go. Lots of people are obviously involved in OpenStack here, so they have an idea, but maybe. Others ask, do not. Let me ask a question. How many people have launched an instance via EC2 or uh, OpenStack? Everybody, right? Yay. That's good. Okay. So you've you've seen what we're talking right. about. Right. Great. So yeah, and yeah. So here is Nova Nova Boot. You know, essentially, to launch an instance on on OpenStack, you're going to pass it some your key name to what key you want to be able to get in with. You know, the server name, the image flavor, and then this thing called user data. Um, and this is very similar across most, most clouds, public, private clouds, OpenStack or Azure or Amazon. They also basically have similar sorts of things when you go to launch an instance. You, know, you select the image, choose a flavor and a type, um, maybe attack some networks, say who can get in, um, and then you know, click go. So under the covers on, on uh, on OpenStack, what happens is you know, OpenStack provisions you a VM and then either uses config drive or the metadata service to provide some information to the instance there. Right? So um, in OpenStack, the two mechanisms are config drive, where it actually attaches a disk to the, to the VM with basically metadata, user data, and vendor data. And then CloudInit or some other instance initialization software will load that up um, and, and respect it. And then the other path is through the metadata service, which is at that, um, at that address. And CloudInit or some other software basically knows that. DHCP is off ETH0 or somehow gets networking up and then addresses that. Um, it won't. Go back. Let's show the show the metadata just as a as a thing. Click on. All right. Let's see. Here's some examples here. You can click them on later too if you want. But this is uh, one example that I put up from a real VM. Let's see if we can get it to load. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, oh no. Maybe not. Maybe. No. <laughs> Let me try. Let me uh, try. Okay. Good. 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 So. Yeah. So. I mean, essentially, these are the kinds of things that are in the metadata. The, the OpenStack then provides the instance with information on the availability zone, um, you know, what, what your name is, some network information configuration, and things like that in, in the instance ID. And so CloudNet or another instance initialization service is going to use that bits of information. And yeah, so you can see, like, for example, like, there's some special stuff that's in here, that uh, host name all. And lots of information about your servers, plus, plus other things that you, you can actually put in for vendor-specific information, too, if you want. So let's go back here. We can click on let's, I'll show you the config drive, which is sort of similar to you. Might as well. It's a little bit, it's, if you can think of a web server as having like a file system layout, that's basically what it sort of becomes. Yeah, so yeah, and then in OpenSec, the config drive and the metadata service basically render the same the same data so that they're consistent. Now, clearly, the, the config drive is a um, one-shot thing where the metadata service could be more dynamic in the future. And in other clouds, it is more dynamic. And Amazon populates it with some new information. But And you can't write to it. Yeah, sure. Go ahead with your question. Oh, yeah. So the, OK. We'll get rid of that. <laughs> so that was from Sochi. There was some, apparently some. Uh, 
<laughs> not sure why we were discussing that. But that was an earlier up. topic today. Thank you. You don't, you don't. You can look it up later if you want to know. Sochi toilet security. <laughs> that, that's all you need to know. Google. Google or Yahoo. Or use Yahoo. Please. Use Yahoo. <laughs> but not too secure. That was, that was the final result. Yeah. So I think. So generally speaking, that's how the instance gets access to data about it in one of those two ways on OpenStack. And they vary in different clouds. Sometimes you end up going through a, a, serial, con a serial device. Um, on Azure, you mount a CD-ROM and take some data off of it. it one way or another, the, the basic concept is there. And Ironic, I think, has a different way for there maybe talks on that later this week, too. There's this, it's sort of another kind of way to get data there. I think it may be a partition or, or something like that. But there's various ways getting some kind of metadata or user data onto the instance so something else can take advantage of it. So sort of what it's used for, I mean, why do you want to have this kind of metadata or user data available at all is, is a common question. Usually you, you want to try to uh, maybe have your instance sort of perform some kind of boot time initialization, not, not necessarily using cloud init to do everything, but using some kind of uh, standard software you already have, like a Puppet or Chef or Ansible or SaltStack or uh, there's a bunch of other ones now. Uh, or you want to allow yourself to SSH in to do various commands, right? Or you want to install some packages. So maybe you want to... <coughs> Maybe you need to get Chef installed before you start using Chef. So you need to sort of connect Chef in and then start running Chef. Uh, Yahoo and other, probably other companies have some other stuff that sets up uh, various other packages for, at least for Yahoo use case, we have installing users via another package as well. Uh, some, some Yahoo specific things that people can run so they can run commands that do some Yahoo specific programs. And that's all sort of extensible via Cloud and, and you can pass that in via user data or uh, or you can have it automatically happen via pre-configured package uh, cloud in it configuration. So how does all this happen is sort of a good question. And you probably, if, you, if you've ever messed around with the user data section in the instant, like if you go to Horizon and there's a, usually a tab or a box where you can, it's sort of not necessarily known for what the heck it is. So at least at our company, Yahoo, we've had to make sure that we make it pretty declarative. What is this box and how can you use it? And so anyway, but you can do various, various things, actually a lot of things. Some people use it for just dropping shell scripts in to say, like, instead of having Cloud Inut do a bunch of package management or install packages, they just want to run RPM themselves or, or they want to run, yeah, Hi Mom or whatever. And so the main, that, so the first example, the simple one, is allows for some pretty powerful stuff. But one of the things that's natively supported is that Cloud Inut tries to provide this added functionality on top using a various kind of Python modules that it provides. And that standard format, that those are configured as via YAML. So for example, this one here will activate a Cloud Init module that will try to do distro agnostic things uh, to install packages. So like for the top example, if when you're running Bash, you sort of, you sort of have to do all the distro agnostic things like, like yourself, basically. You have to like do if Red Hat release or if Ubuntu, and then you have to do this or that. So Cloud Init tries to provide sort of packages that do that automatically for you, along, along with some other packages that do various neat things, like uh, mounting your drives that you may have attached. I think there's some couple more. So here's, some, here's sort of how we're using it at Yahoo is, an, is a good example, too. A lot of people have made Git repos or standard uh, kind of uh, things they can share with their team to uh, basically uh, configure Chef or configure, well, mostly Chef at Yahoo. They can configure Chef. They can install packages. They can pass around, like, how do I, how do I get my user? Maybe, have, maybe all my team wants to be on certain package version, and they want to all have it pre-installed so they can all share this uh, same cloud config that, or the YAML file or Bash script or whatever. They can put it somewhere where it can be version controlled in a standard manner. And that sort of leaves it out of the image. Other, like the other way they could do it is they could make a bake a custom image, they could snapshot it, and then that's sort of the whole system is frozen at that point, which is not, at least for Yahoo, and not what we've been trying to encourage because the rest of the whole system is frozen, including all the packages, all the, you lose all the security updates. You basically, the whole thing is frozen in time versus having this uh, user thing in user data file or whatever in Git, and you can version it, you can look at the history, and you're not really tying yourself to any specific image too tightly, as long as you stay away from, like, if you do bash scripts in Git, then you're gonna, you're gonna be tied to an image, at least a version of a distribution, potentially. 
Uh, other thing that it sort of does, it uh, makes that clear boundary as I sort of stated there. You can, you can decouple the image from how it's uh, being uh, ran or how it's starting up and what it's installing. Uh, yeah, so the other thing, as I mentioned before, it's cross-platform. It's not just, as was shown before, it's not just uh, Red Hat or Ubuntu. It's various different images of different operating system types that all sort of understand the same YAML format and they can uh, basically run the same commands and, and additional distributions without any difficulty. So it's sort of nice. So let's see here. Uh, yeah, so some of the stages we're reading from, there's, there's, there's various stages that it goes through to pull this off. And there's basically three stages. Uh, one is one is this, the concept of a data source in cloud in it. It's it's where you can imagine the metadata stuff that was mentioned before. Metadata is one source of information. It's an open stack. It's an open stack and EC2 specific kind of concept. Other ones such as CoreOS, uh, they get it from different places. Uh, you may get it from a config drive. You may get it from a web service. You may get it from a serial port. Uh, there's a, Azure has a different one, right? So there are all these various places that you can get it from. So this is called the initialization phase, and the data source is where that information is coming from. And so, at that point, basically, yeah. Cloud Init comes up, and it, it starts looking around for different yes. modules. And each of the data sources is, um, there's a number of them configured or in Cloud Init, um, and it basically goes through looking for one that it finds the, Finds the source that it's looking for. So, you, in, if you ever seen like, an, if you look at Etsy cloud cloud config on your instance, you can sort of see what the order is and what it's looking for. There's like a data sources section in that YAML config that says like EC2, OpenStack, maybe some other ones, and so it will try to find the first one there and use that as the source of information. They're meant to get out early when they don't yeah. find something, yeah. but as you. If you've used it a lot, you may well have seen the Amazon one kind of pulling around, and it's kind of a legacy thing as Amazon, oftentimes early Amazon, Ubuntu would boot faster than the Amazon metadata service would be there. So you just kind of had to pull and ask for it again. Do you have it now? Do you have it now? And so that's kind of legacy. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a problem anymore, but it, it props its head up. <laughs> So after it's found the data source, and there's the, so that the data source usually contains all of your information. So it's going to consume that and write it to disk. If you've seen like a, if you look under var lib cloud in your instance, I think that's the standard location where all this is written. You'll see a bunch of the stuff that it has saved, and it will it will basically write that user data down. And various things will happen on the user data. I think there's a section on that in the next slide that happens. What happens to the user data is it may get bigger, it may get, it may change itself. So downloading additional user data. It may be composed of various formats that will, that will sort of affect how it gets used later. So after that, that big initialization phase, what happens is the next two stages are mostly just module running. So after this, all that data has been consumed and written somewhere, it is going to uh, run various modules listed in your configuration that you've probably seen if you look at Etsy Cloud, cloud.cfg or whatever. Uh, you'll see all the modules that are potentially going to run. They don't all have to run based on configuration that you passed in. They may turn them off, may turn them on, may, may not run at all. But, so here's a little visual diagram of sort of the stages. You can see, this is maybe a little hard to read, but these are sort of the, some of the modules that are by default included in the initialization one. For example, you may not be able to see it, but there's a, a SSH keys is down in here, a, a grub uh, stuff is in here, package installing uh, up at the top. There's some basic ones like writing files, doing some first kind of boot initialization stuff, stuff that you may not want to happen at the later stages because of ordering dependencies or whatever. At the last one, you'll see like there's one that's sort of useful. There's a phone home one, which is sort of neat, and not a lot of people know about it. But when your system is done booting, actually you can call out to some other web service and say, I'm done and here's my information, and it allows for some pretty powerful concepts that people are starting to take advantage of, at least at Yahoo, to, bis to uh, say now, once, they've, once they know that the cloud is done, maybe Chef is done at that point too, because there's a Chef module that's not listed in here, but there would be one, and then they can say, okay, now I can start the second stage of my stuff, and then I can continue on doing maybe, I don't know, more advanced, to, maybe I can start my performance analysis or something on the VM, or start serving traffic or whatever. So that's sort of a neat one. Uh, so one of the things that's sort of neat about a user data is that it's actually much more powerful than I think many people realize, and that CloudInit has some concepts that are sort of somewhat well documented, somewhat well, somewhat not, <laughs> but they're there. And if you know about them, you can do some neat, really neat stuff. Like you can combine, I think, my, I don't know, maybe Scott knows the historical reason, but there was a reason 
like we wanted to have uh, this archive format so you can pay, you can combine together multiple uh, cloud config uh, YAML basically files together into one file. I think there was a size limit that was the one originally part of the reason, maybe. So, yeah, so Amazon has there was a 16K right. blob associated for the instance. I think um, OpenStack, there is a limit on the size. I think it's 65K, maybe. Oh, so, it's it? it's yeah. like, it's whatever, though. There's a MySQL field where this so is it, all stored. And it can be gzipped. I mean, it can be compressed, and CloudNet will arbitrarily uncompress it. But, um, but yeah, there's a limit, and so we added the include support, so you can say, you know, get this from your GitHub account or yep. these other URLs, you know, get more information. So it allows you to basically create as, as much or as little as you want. And, and if you can't fit it all in your user data because your cloud provider's limitations, you can put it somewhere else and then fetch it. And so some of the stuff I already talked about, like there's, there's these module plugins, there's a, like 30 of them, I think, now, and they do various things. You can combine those in your configuration, and you can, uh, if you want to run Chef, or if you don't want to run Chef, you can take it in, take it out. Uh, there's another concept that's even more advanced, and I don't know how many people know it, but you can add, there's this thing called part handlers, where a part is a piece of the multi-part message that's uh, actually used. And you can, you can specify your own kind of Python code that actually gets used to process that message, and you can do various things based with that. It's, it's pretty advanced, I don't know how many people actually use it, but there's some, there's some that know about it, and if, if if you have any good, interesting use cases for it, I'd like to hear it actually afterwards, because <laughs> I've always wondered, and maybe 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 Scott knows. So that. well, since the yeah, so since the 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 input to CloudNet is multiple parts, CloudNet will just ignore things it doesn't understand, and then one of the types, if it comes to a part that is called a part handler, can declare it as a part handler, it'll um, load it as Python, call a method that will then register. I you know I handle these part types. And then subsequently, as it goes through the list, it will call you then and say, hey, handle this part type. Right. So then it allows you to get into, allows you to shove code into the instance early in boot mm -hmm. and then kind of act like that was there originally. So, if, yeah, if it'd be interesting. Do you, you know people that have been using it? I don't know. I'm, anyway, you can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. We'll skip that for now. So some of, the, some of the formats that it sort of understands by default, the gzipped one, so you can save space on, if you only have 16K and you need 17K of data, you can compress it down and you can hopefully fit it. Uh, the multi-part MIME one is sort of an interesting one. If, you, if you've ever used email, it's that kind of format. Uh, user scripts, which you can basically bash scripts and stuff like that, which I showed with another example previously. The include URLs, so that's, you can basically paste a bunch of these URLs with a special include, like uh, C or whatever, and then it will download those and combine them together uh, as different pieces for you. So that's even the more safe uh, space, uh, saving, say, saving space. <clears throat> and then you can, of course, just use YAML. You can use upstart uh, jobs. I haven't ever tried that one, but uh, yeah, because we're Red Hat, but we're using Red Hat. Uh, <laughs> And then you can do Cloud Boot Hook, which is another one, uh, the part handler one, which, was, which Scott was talking about. So I bought a, put a bunch of examples up. Some of these are from Yahoo. Like uh, Maybe this one will be interesting. This, there's, a, there's a big push for going for Chef at Yahoo, and that's, this is actually, like I improved, I, I had to do some reworking of the Chef module for CloudNet to make it so they could use it up to whatever standard they want. So that was, that's all in. I think it's released recently or a little while ago. And this is sort of an example from one of them. Let's see. I had to modify it a little bit, not too much. Take out some of the keys, <laughs> obviously. So, yeah, you can see like some of the, there's a chef server at Yahoo. There's some names of some validation stuff. Um, they set up some keys, I guess, for the, this is all, I'm not 100% aware of all the chef concepts, but they, these are the main ones, I think, the, the PEM keys and stuff. And they make sure it's installed, actually, so it has the Chef RPMs. So it's nothing too special, but this has been a pretty big, last six months at Yahoo, been a lot of Chef stuff that's been going on, trying to move away from internal kind of deployment tools to Chef. So they've taken advantage of this. I think it's being used quite a bit on all the VMs that we run on OpenStack and Bare Metal after that. And so it's pretty neat. There's some other ones, uh, the multi-part one you can look at later when these slides are online. Uh, Another one that's sort of neat that's, that has been used is you can make it actually benchmark stuff. Say you want to just fire up a VM and you want to run some benchmark on it to maybe test how your VM is doing or whatever kind of performance stuff. You can automatically put this, uh, uh, for example, a script in there that says I need some curl package. 
I need this thing to run, which this file will be. This will be like the script that runs. And there's yeah, all the executable permissions. And then after it's done executing, it's going to turn the whole machine off, the VM off. And then that will be, I think on some clouds, I think on Amazon, they won't charge you. I'm not 100% sure on this. They won't charge you for VMs that are powered off. So you're basically just running it as a performance thing and then turning it right off. And you're probably only spending whatever, however long the test run is for. And then you're saving, you, you can just basically gather the data you want and get the heck out of the VM and delete it later, I guess. So that's one use case from a coworker that was doing that kind of stuff for some analysis for internal VM comparisons or whatever. Uh, yeah, most of these are, the rest of them are pretty basic. So what else does it do? These are some of the more things that people you can do with it. This, so remember, these are also sort of distro agnostic. It's trying to provide an abstraction layer that makes it so you don't have to care if you're running on Ubuntu or, or Red Hat or, or CoreOS or whatever, all these different types, and FreeBSD actually too now. So it's trying to provide an abstraction over that. So you can set the host name, it will set your mount points, it will do some distro package installations for you. The main one you're probably used to is the public key one. Uh, entry pre-source and one was new, so you can make your VM not have a, a bad entropy, which it will maybe have if you're, if you're not doing it correctly. Uh, some other examples are online on, on Bazaar or in, in more examples on our cloud, the I'll read the docs page there. So as was mentioned before, there's a whole bunch of data sources. This is sort of the listing. It's sort of interesting to check it out. The Google GCE was relatively recent. Uh, DigitalOcean one was relatively recent. Uh, Azure, I think, was somewhat recent, too. But I forget. Uh, SmartOS was somewhat recent, too. But they all, they all, so this is sort of shows that Cloud Native has been used in a lot of places. It's been, and it's being used to provide like a standard kind of initialization format and usage for many different clouds. And I'm pretty proud that this list is going to be growing and growing. Like the last, I think when I joined, maybe, Three years ago, it was OpenStack and maybe CloudStack and EC2, maybe Maz, I think, too. <laughs> and then it's been going from Azure Jump popped in, GCE popped in, Joint people popped in. And we've got a good, yeah, yeah and we've got a good, and a lot of these have come from the vendor, the cloud vendor, actually. Mm -hmm. So it, it indicates, you know, we're getting acceptance and people are interested in making their instances on their cloud work. Um, so that's good. Yeah, we're not having to do all the code, so that's the, great. The no cloud one is an interesting one in that. Um, it explicitly is designed for you to be able to launch a VM kind of directly with K KVM or libvirt on your local system, feed it some data, have it do the thing, and then be done, um, and not involve setting up a, a fancy metadata service or a cloud or anything. You can, you can kind of launch an instance, do some stuff, tear it down, and be done with it. So, so any question? Sure. So, um, you can, so in, by default, each of these, in, in like an Ubuntu image, each of these is enabled. Um, in config, you can disable them if you want or just say which explicit ones should be looked for. And then it basically goes through a, a list with EC2 because of the polling at the end um, and walks down and, and looks. Most of them are declarative. Are, are, are safe in that they're, you know, they're not going, they can get out early. Like the ones that are on the, um, shoot, well, the disk, like the no cloud is a, is a CD or is a file system that's attached that has a label that, of no cloud. And so then it will just look through disks, look at their file systems and find that. And if it's not there, it says, oh, not there. And so most of them behave basically like that. It looks for indications of here. A lot of them actually now, to avoid. Retrying this, though. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see. Some of them that we're looking at dev TTY as zero. That's a, you know, a, a device from the 1980s. And it's not very well. You can, you can kind of get yourself into trouble poking around at it. Um, so a lot of those now, that is. The joint one, no? Joint, yeah, I think joint, and there might be one other. They, they look at DMI information. So joint, when they launch an instance, they expose it as a joint cloud, and so cloud init looks, and if that's not there, he doesn't even bother going further on it. So they're intended to basically be safe. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so they are all access, and they try to probe. That's the goal, is yeah, as, at least for the, yeah, I mean, for cloud init in general, we want to be able to take, you, we want you to be able to take an image 
and just run it wherever there is a cloud, right? Would and so make one image that's going to work for you everywhere. And the Ubuntu images are it almost bit for bit on all of our official images identical. So yeah, I don't actually the Fedora images I think are similar. They have I don't know which ones they enable. I haven't checked, but for Yahoo at least I know we're, we're we shrunk down that list to the, we only run one type. So we're we shrunk it down to like uh, I think OpenStack EC2. I don't I forgot why I left it in. And then and then like no op no cloud at the end just so if if nothing really works or something's really wrong. We can have at least some fallback. So, but I think the idea is that you don't have to do build your own cloud in it. You can leave the config as is, and it should be somewhat smart in figuring yeah. it out. And if you find issues, please open bugs. I mean, uh, we want one image that works places. So yep. that that's a serious issue. Jeff, what's the what's the recommended method for passing Keystone credentials if you wanted to make an API call from cloud in it? So that's a good question. So I've I've talked to the Keystone folks, and the recommend. Well, I had a spec open that it hasn't still happened, but uh, I th think the recommendation is you can use user data to do that, no problem. And, but you want a more of a native interaction, right, where it doesn't have to be any kind of it's automatic well, I'm, with I'm, OpenStack. I'm thinking from a security standpoint, if I put the credentials in user data, then I've got credentials sitting out there somewhere that are accessible. Mm -hmm. So that's so the chef issue at Yahoo. We had we had that kind of question, and it's still an ongoing question. So there's been there's been a, there was a delegation service sort of made that will fetch your keys, and, and the only keys will only last for like five minutes. So they will expire after the chef job is done. So there is a delegation service that Yahoo has that does that. I think if people still pass it via user data, they're told to basically rotate it as pretty often so that they don't. If they, if you expose yourself, you're only exposing yourself till it's next rotated. I think there's ongoing involvement with the chef team, at least from my perspective. But for Keystone, I'm not 100% sure. I know this similar question had with with Chef at Yahoo is like that PEM keys, those profile keys are sort of you can install whatever those things can install at that point. Amazon has a solution ish right. for that. I don't know if you're aware. In their metadata service, there's basically a, a set of keys that are for that instance, and then the user you know, you, you could delegate whatever power you want to those keys, and those keys rotate. So I mean, that's something that, that uh, OpenStack could have and, and, and tie into the, the metadata service also. It, it would be a, a useful thing. Maybe it's something we need to bring up with the Keystone folks to make sure. I think it, I, I've talked to them a little bit about it before, but I haven't followed up too much. But something we can do. So yeah, as we were talking about here, all those different companies that are doing this that we sort of mentioned before. Some that are just running images from various places, uh, like Rackspace or uh, yeah, different ones, OpenStack in general. So sort of where it's useful, it's pretty much everywhere almost. Every image you ever launched, it's been somewhat involved. And the container stuff is an interesting question. Maybe Scott can talk about that later. But here's where he starts. There's, so this is sort of. <laughs> This is sort of a, a little bit of a reworking of some of Cloud, and I'll let him get into more details, but I'll give like overview or general introduction. There's some stuff that we wanted to do with Windows that there's some, I don't know if they're in the room, but uh, there's some Windows folks that were doing a, this thing called Cloud Base, which is similar to Cloud in a way, but handles the Windows booting. Uh, we wanted to do some more advanced stuff with uh, integration. When things are hot plugged into your instance, say your network or your uh, volume, Cloud in it, is, is would like to be the thing that actually handles what should it do with that network once it's been plugged in or unplugged. Uh, and Neutron, I think, supports that stuff. No, OpenStack sort of supports that. Amazon supports it. So there's a question of what does the user basically have to go into that VM or bare metal or whatever and mount the, mount the drive themselves? Do they have to configure the network again? So that's, there's some limitations in the current cloud in it that it's, it's not ready for. So we're hoping to address some of that in the, this new version that we're calling CloudNet 2.0. And Scott was not on Star Trek, but <laughs> uh, you won't notice. So anyway, go ahead. So yeah, so we're, CloudNet 2 is really just just starting in its in its development, and we're really hoping to address kind of a lot of the issues that that I've seen, and um, basically you know short sightedness when developing something over time. Um, that I think we can more cleanly address. One of the big things that for people, um, I know for a lot of contributors, the, that especially that come from large companies, the previous license of GPLv3 was not necessarily the favorite of enterprise lawyers. Um, so we are relicensing under a pat it's a dual license of Apache 2 and uh, GPLv3, but 
Um, and so essentially, you know, that most of the time I've heard that Apache 2 is a good license, so it should be acceptable. So if that if helps that's you. been annoying to you before, please reconsider. Yeah. And reconsider contributing also. Um, we, are, we are a StackForge project now. We, uh, code is hosted there and Git and then downstream mirrors at uh, GitHub, just like most of the OpenStack projects. Um, we've got Garrett Reviews and um, yeah, oh, and we'll, we'll have continuous integration set up. Um, the cloud-based people are setting, setting some up, and Canonical will also have some. And we're interested if, if third parties want to do voting, uh, you know, feedback on, on reviews, we'll also be open to that. Garrett gives us a nice you know, workflow that you're probably already familiar with for that sort of thing. Yeah, so one of the things that was mentioned, like all those, all those various Fedora or Ubuntu, we want to have sort of a more automated testing that makes sure that when we change something in CloudNet that we're not busting everybody else. So having some ability to do that automatically would be, is pretty, would be pretty nice. So. And then, yeah, and then so CloudBase is, is the company that has done, that did CloudBase in it. They're, they're focused on the Windows support and then Canonical and, and Yahoo. And then we've got some other people uh, to contribute and hopefully we'll have, have more, have people contributing. So, um, and then also I, I, if you've gone Googling for documentation on CloudNet, I will absolutely Except that Doc is lacking, um, yeah. so we're hoping to do a better job of that. And it's gotten better. <laughs> um, yeah, and then these are so Python. We'll, we're attempting. The the goal is to attempt to support uh, Rel six. So Python two point six is the the big thing there, and then two seven and three four. Um, you know, a single code base that works for both. Um, and then yeah, Windows. Vista and going forward, and then also FreeBSD, and um, there's some other operating systems that have been suggested could will will have or would like to have CloudNet support too. So I know some folks from IBM are interested in having their AIX support. So we want to we want to support that and want to give people the ability to use CloudNet there. Um, wherever we can, we'll do backwards compatibility. If it's just completely not sane, then I. Uh, but I'm willing to be pushed on that too. So. <laughs> I don't want people to have to, you know, I, I don't want people to have to know what's inside an image, you know, to as much as little as possible. So yeah, as, as um, Josh suggested, CloudNet in 0.7 has been very uh, init, and many times people have asked about a, a persistent agent or event-based responses, and I've always been kind of saying that CloudNet is the thing that gets you to something more intelligent. Um, and so that's how a lot of people have used it to tie into Chef or Puppet or, um, you know, or Juju or some other management system that is doing further, further management. But there's a lot of things that it would make sense, that it makes sense for CloudNet to do after boot. Um, and hot plug of devices is the, the big thing. Um, if you're familiar with Amazon, the way that when they attach a device, you get a hot plug NIC. If you look in the metadata service, there's information about what that NIC should look like, well, you know, what it should be configured. It has the MAC address and then you know, this IP address and these routes. And so Amazon Linux has some things that respond to that and configure your NIC automatically for you. Um, we'd like for CloudNet to have that sort of stuff built in so that our, the Ubuntu images and any images using CloudNet on Amazon will get that. And then there's um, some there's uh, some specs and review for OpenStack that will do something similar. we we'll provide more, uh, gosh, config-oriented description of what your network should look like than right now, if you're familiar that the information that you get about networking configuration on OpenStack is a file that is formatted in Etsy network interfaces style. Yep. Um, so hopefully going forward, that'll be a more declarative network description. CloudNet will then consume it and render the network. So there's a couple of specs I've seen, at least one just yesterday and another one, we'll see, I think there's ongoing for that. And I guess Cinder has the same kind of question, like how do you determine what the volume device should be that popped up, or maybe Manila has the same kind of question in the end. Right, yeah, and we'd like, so we'd like for CloudNet to be around for those sorts of things also. As a, it, as a block device gets, gets added, if the metadata service provides you information on what should be done with that, CloudNet could then you know, render a RAID array to that, to a you know, series of them, and then put a file system on it and mount it for the user. 
And then so to the user, that's all magic and transparent because clearly that's not, that's not stuff anybody really wants to care about. Um, and then for lifecycle events, CloudNet has always had this idea of not, of you don't need to capture it. So it goes and looks, at, looks for instance, a new instance ID and acts on a new instance. If, it's, if it finds itself, it's new. But um, a lifecycle event might come from a, the cloud provider that says, hey, I'm going to take you down. Or the user requested you go, you go down for capture, or you go down for um, file system sync. And so CloudNet could FS freeze the file system or might bring itself down and actually do the clean you know, to, to make itself more ready for capture. Um, and then, yeah, and, and we'll have ways that you can tie into those hooks. So. Windows 1 will be interesting. I haven't mentioned it. Sure, question. For those lifecycle hooks, are you thinking of hooking the metadata service for that? Um, of hooking it? Well, how would you get the event into the operating system? Um, yeah, so either either an event, um, maybe something come up through the, you know, like an ACP, shutdown's easy, an ACPI event or something like that, but, but then the purpose of that is different, yeah, and so if the metadata service did provide me after I got an ACPI event that said, hey, I'm going down for capture, or why are you, or, or also some way that you could run and say, hey, CloudNet, you know, you're going down one way or another, even if the user had to poke it to have an interface to do that. And then going forward, things can be built on top of that. I think we want to try to make it so it's not like a pulling thing or you don't have to poke right. it too much. But I think that's, I don't know how Amazon's pulling it off. Uh, probably, hopefully something that works in a scalable and not like user Yeah, CloudNet's not just going to sit there and pull on a metadata service as much as, unless that's, that's necessary, necessary, right? Cool. Um, and these, yeah, I think we already covered both of these things, so. Similar kind of things. Yep. Yeah, so I guess the, the one thing, networking has been a pain in, for CloudNet, and, um, and it's largely because Cloud has kind of been a, uh, pretended that networking didn't exist, that the, the operating system that you got was configured already um, to do the right thing on networking, and usually that meant DHCP on ETH0. But in, in, you know, the, it's becoming the standard case that, that's, that networking is more complex than that, right? Um, and so going forward, we'll have hooks into the operating system, into System D or Upstart or System 5 init that basically enforce that Cloud Init is able to find a network configuration source prior to the networking coming up. So we don't have to deal with the networking came up, now I've got to take it down and bring it back up, and we'll block and set all those things correctly. Mentioned the block device one, so I guess we can move ahead of that one. Oh yeah, okay. I guess we're at the we are here at the question stage. So yeah, sure. Go ahead in the front. How does the one six nine one five four address really work? Like who answers that? And what's the interaction with the no zero com? Like I've had some examples where the VM boots up and it hangs for twenty seconds because it gets no answer. So the no zero one, I, the, you may know. I, I know a little bit about the history of the one six nine, but it's, it's implemented, I believe, in Neutron V. Well, I watch. I can't exactly. Yeah, I, but Neutron has some logic to connect it. Uh, there's like an IP tables rule in, in Nova Network that made sure that that was available to the instance. The meta, it's a metadata service as part of Nova that runs and answers that and answers it, um, the and then one. Nova sets up. Yeah, or Nova and Neutron work together to set up routes to this metadata service. So yeah, the zero, no zero comp, I've, I've heard of that for some reason. I'm not sure why, but there's, yeah, I think I've seen that too. I forget exactly the reason what it, what it is, so maybe I can look into it and come back. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So following on from that, then I would presume the IP stack is up and running at that stage. How do you do first boot commands if you were using that mechanism? Um, if you're using, if you're finding the network? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, figuring networking configuration from the network source is going to be interesting. In the, in the OpenStack case where you would have config drive and a metadata service, potentially config drive gives you initial met config, network config information, and then you just kind of use that to get to the metadata service. We have to solve these things for sure, um, and then also indicating, oh, this is the first time I'm up, I should kill all networking from the previous time versus the user configured stuff, and they don't want me to do that because that's not nice. Like snapshotting is a, is a yeah, yeah, that's what he's talking about. So there's definitely some interesting problems to solve there. Uh, Jay. Jay. Hey, um, so I know that there are other implementations of cloud and type of things. Like cloud base was one of them, but um, you know I'm very happy to see the merge. The um, but like CoreOS has cloud and it implemented, for instance, that has 
similar but different configuration. Mm -hmm. Has there been any thought of um, maybe more formally specifying the user data so that um, other programs can maybe have cross compatibility with it? Um, I've talked to the 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 CoreOS team at one point, and, and they were, they're open to doing that sort of thing and trying to, um, where it makes sense to, they've actually, I think, they said where it makes sense they've used the config information that, that CloudInit did just in, in order to do that. But I, I'm open to doing that, and as we go forward with CloudInit 2, I really want the, the modules to declare a better job, do a better job of declaring what they're expecting, to have a JSON schema and things and be able to check the, their intake. There's lots of fixes. <laughs> cool, so it looks like we're running out of time, but maybe one more. Yeah, sure. Um, so I know that you can, you can, you can for user scripts that are, are bash scripts, that one's more outside of CloudNet, but if you can turn up the log, leving, log level in CloudNet, you can start seeing a lot of things that we found useful. But if it's, a, if it's like a bash script, it's just going to, CloudNet basically at some point just execs that bash script and then it's up to the bash script to echo whatever it needs to echo. Uh, do you have any other recommendations? Varlog CloudNet um, dot log is extremely verbose. I mean, I, most of the time when somebody asks me what's going wrong, if, I, if, they, if they're able to paste that, I can figure it out. That's where, so that's there. And then also, by default, varlog cloud init dash output dot log contains any, any programs that were run by any of the path of cloud init, like its standard output is getting teed into that file. So lots of times you'll see, you know, like a program error output in that file that went to console otherwise and is often a, is often dev null. So. All right, great. thanks All right, for well, showing thank up, you. guys. Yeah. Thank you.